Please remain standing for a moment of reflection for our servicemen and women throughout the world and for all those who died in our community, particularly Jacqueline Rose Vitrus, beloved wife, mother of Scranton DPW employee and president of IAMAW Local 2305, Sam Vitrus, grandmother and great-grandmother, and her dear family and friends who suffer her loss. Call, please. Mr. McGough? Here. Mr. Rogan? Here. Mr. Loscombe? Here. Mr. Joyce? Here. Mrs. Evans? Here. Uh, as soon as Mrs. Crake returns, we'll dispense with the reading of the minutes. Dispense with the reading of the minutes, please. Third order, 3A, audit status report received from Robert Rossi and Company dated June 19th, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3B, tax assessor's report appeal hearing results dated June 12th, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3C, tax assessor's report for hearing date of July 10th, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3D, minutes of the Scranton Lackawanna Health and Welfare Authority's regular meeting held on May 16th, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3E, 2012 Combined Audit Report for the Scranton Lackawanna Health and Welfare Authority. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3F, Minutes of the Firemen's Pension Commission meeting held on March 27, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3G, Notification from the Firemen's Pension Commission that meetings were not held on April 24, 2013 and May 22, 2013 due to lack of quorum. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. Do we have any clerk's notes tonight, Mrs. Craig? No, Mrs. Evans. Thank you. And do any council members have announcements at this time? Yes, I have two. Um, they're both actually for the same young boy. Um, the first one, July 18th and 19th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. at Hyde Park Hair Fashions. They are having um, a benefit for Hunter Rikus. Hunter has global development delays that caused by chromosomal breakage. Um, he has just started to walk but is not talking. Um, he receives therapy at St. Joseph's and the, the NEIU. Um, the, he is doing much better but um, the cost of communication devices, braces for legs, um, and many other items that insurance um, do not pay for. So that's at Hyde Park Hair Fashions, um, again, July 18th and 19th, yeah. and you can just go in and let them know that you're there for the benefit for Hunter. Also, there's a benefit cookout for Hunter on Saturday, August 17th from 2 to 6 p.m. at the Eagles Club. Um, tickets are $15. Food, beverage, and music will be provided, as well as basket raffles. Um, tickets can be purchased by calling Joanne Barber at 570-343-1110 or Tracy Rikus, 570-335-8847. Um, checks also can be, may, be made out to the Hunter Rikus Donation Fund and mailed to 1204 Rock Street, 
Scranton, 18504. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Mrs. Craig? Fourth order, citizens' participation. Our first and only speaker that has signed in this evening is Dave Dobson. Good evening, Council. Dave Dobson, resident of Scranton. Good evening. Good evening. Taxes and fees paid. Uh, I have uh, two questions tonight. Uh, I submit them in writing, or will, on uh, recent articles in the Scranton Times. Uh, one, I think it was the day of the last meeting. I didn't save the article. I may be able to find it. But uh, it reads, recently, the Times Tribune ran an article on $7.8 million owed in trash fees that were delinquent. If so, are there any ongoing attempts to collect and establish? And I suspect the cause was Northeast Credit Collections. Uh, in the past. Uh, I had trouble with the trash fee. When I purchased my house in 2002, they did not get me a bill. Um, it got missed in the closing. And uh, I was up there. I purchased an adjoining lot that was tax delinquent. And they told me, they had me right there on the computer. And they told me nothing of this bill being owed. I thought it was covered in my closing. It had my credit rating uh, uh, muddied and, and so forth. And uh, it was knocking me down a few points there. And I'm very curious on this and uh, what we can do and how much is really owed. And who knows if, if it will ever get collected. Uh, uh, but uh, it certainly needs to be addressed. And another article mentioned a suit filed by unions to raise retirement pensions from 50 to 70 percent. Uh, if so, is this guaranteed by contract? And does your counsel, uh, meaning our, our attorney, uh, feel we are at risk for more large settlements and further costs in the future? So with your permission, I'll drop this off. Yes, actually, if you can give it to Ms. Carrera, please. Anyway, and now I'd like to speak about uh, some of the events of the last couple of weeks. Uh, I have one question on the proposed parking lot on what is the Kapals Avenue. Mm -hmm. That uh, who would maintain that? Because keeping in mind that our bridges are loaded with ice on the walkways and so forth all winter and uh, you know there would be grass that needed to be cut hedges needed to be trimmed and plowing possibly in the winter that needed to be done and and that's just the question in my mind I mean uh, uh, the uh, donation of the lot is somewhat neutral but there and again the maintenance of it uh, could be another story and it could lead to unhappiness in the future. Uh, and now I'd like to talk about council and the current history of this council. Uh, when you people ran, I think it was in 2009, uh, it was my understanding that you accepted no corporate donations whatsoever. Not a dime came from any corporations, other than maybe a little restaurant or something like that, throwing a fundraiser. Uh, but there is no major corporations. Uh, now, since from day one almost, the Scranton Times has constantly, especially the editorial page, harassed, ex excluding our uh, friend Jim here. He, he's been fairly decent with the city. But uh, uh, questions asked about medical conditions, questions asked about uh, that were, were nobody's business and constant, constant, every two weeks. There's been five articles on this issue with the Scranton University and it's been reopened. So what's the gripe? I mean, one person voted against it. Okay. It's still, a, it's, it's actually a, a super majority voted for it. 
uh, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit on ideological grounds, but I've seen other people vote against tax increases or whatever on ideological grounds because they knew it was going to pass anyway. So, oh, you know, it, it's just, uh, it's silliness. It's silliness. And uh, I would like to see the university with a few people in the audience ask the Scranton Times to lay off. This is the end of the uh, the end of the uh, your uh, term, and is winding down, uh, Mrs. Evans. And I don't see why you have to be in the paper every day. The courts were against us. The legislature is redefining uh, uh, tax exempts, and it doesn't sound good for small cities. And 33 percent of our town is nonprofits or or tax exempts, as I call them. Uh, so uh, in that respect, I mean, you people have tried to do what you were supposed to do and what you agreed to try and do. And if it didn't get done, uh, start looking at other areas. And if you want to come up with a couple of, uh, a, a couple of uh, other editorials, uh, start looking at the courts and the legislature and so forth that won't let us do what we really need to do, which is collect a few fees and pilots and, and so forth, and give it a better bite instead of just asking us, what do we want manna from heaven? Thank you, uh, Mr. Dobson. Uh, one final thing, the, uh, the uh, Golden Parrot goes to the Scranton Times over there, constant editorializing and telling us how our life should be. Thank you, and have a good night. And Thank don't forget, you. Scranton Times, bok bok. Is there anyone Thank else you. who cares to address council? Pardon? From the... That, mm -hmm. Ms. Mrs. Evans, that's the, that's the acoustics in the room. At one point, they changed the speakers to point back towards council, so there's nothing that can be done about that. Thank you, Mrs. Craig. Thank you. Andy Spraley, citizen of Scranton Fellows Cantonians. Uh, you got a lot on the agenda, so I'm just going to go quickly through it, at least some of it. The Linkwood Refuse Fee. The paper said it was something like $8.5 million that we're old for collecting trash. Is that the right figure, or close to it at least? Where a great mistake was made from the Treasury's office because my sister got nailed and I had to go to the bank and find the receipt where we paid. So is this a true figure or a made up figure because they have very poor accounting in the Treasury's office, which I assume they do, if they let a eight and a half million dollars go down the drain. And most of that to the door to years. Something really, really should be done with that. Now, Boscov came up again. I can see that right here. Are we ever going to get that loan? Probably not. We probably should kiss it goodbye because we probably are. They're talking about even going on another 15 years or 12 years more on that loan. Uh, I believe, and uh, our solicitor can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that um, this stems from a loan from the 1990s and then uh, again from 2003. The subordinate loan that the city holds with Scranton Mall Partners. There was the original financing in which the city of Scranton and all other secondary lenders, instead of having them recorded as second, third, and fourth mortgage positions, uh, behind the first mortgage, um, we did a, we did the agreement so that they'd be in what's known as in peri passu, uh, so that there wouldn't be, if there ever was a default, 
the second, third, and fourth mortgages would all share equally, um, irregardless of when they were recorded time-wise. Uh, then later on, uh, there was a refinancing of the mall, and that was refinanced. And again, um, the subordinated position uh, is being, or the bank, what they did, the original mortgage included the Samters, the Oppenheim building, and also the mall. Uh, so that there was the first mortgage on all of them, there was the second mortgages in Perry Passu on them. Uh, in order to refinance the mall the last time, what they did was that they split out the Samters and Oppenheim building uh, for separate financing. And now what they're doing um, is just the refinancing this uh, for the Oppenheim and for the Samters building. And extending the and extending the maturity date to 2025, so that the cash flow and everything will pay the first mortgages and also the second mortgages. But what they're doing is stretching it out to, to lower the payments. Okay, that has nothing to do with the 108 loan we were paying for years and years and years on. I assume <coughs> this is a different one. You do remember the 108 loan mm -hmm. that we were paying mm -hmm. for Boscoff? Okay. We weren't paying. He was paying. As far as I know, the city was paying, if I remember no, right. No, the city never, from what I know, the 108 loan is being paid by Scranton Mall Associates, and they are paying the, the 108 loan. There'd be a default on that, which would put the whole thing into default if the city had to pay it. So that loan is still, I think the terms of that loan, I mean, I haven't really looked into this in years. But that loan is a separate loan and is being paid independently because there were bonds. This meeting's too long. I don't want to get into all of that. Okay. But you know, it had, I could talk for about a half an hour on it, but there's no sense to talk about. Yeah, yeah and I know. only got I only but, got five yeah, minutes. Okay. Well, I, I hope I didn't take out of your time, Andy. <laughs> we want to get in too much into it. You got a lot on the agenda. Now. Uh, well, the Cabrini, I don't exactly know. I heard a lot of rumors that they were planning to close it, if that was a reason. Maybe that was the reason why we're going to go out there and enter into a lease agreement for it. I see no other reason to get a lease agreement with United Neighborhoods other than the fact they were going to close the center. It doesn't make any other sense. Because they're supposed to be a nonprofit. And one of the dealings of a nonprofit is to do things like that. I'm not going to get into it. I only heard rumors on it. So I, I don't know how true they are. But I cannot see no other reason for the city to step in unless they're going to close down the center. OK, we get on to the parking lot that we're going to build for the a and &A Auto there project. It's on the agenda again. I just wondered, is this going to be a place where people can park and walk into town instead of paying exorbitant parking fees? If you're building a parking lot there, I'm certainly they could park their cars there, people coming out of town, and then take the bus into town or walk into town. We have a lot of places where we're park and ride. Within, we used to have one in Scranton, too, down there where Abdella's place is, but things keep changing. But since our police station never got their final coating of paving. I don't know why we have all this money to pave private parking lots for people, unless we're going to say anybody in the city, namely, could park there and walk to town if they want to on a nice day, which would probably be good. I could say it would relieve some of the congestion in town, but it wouldn't help the meters any or the parking authority. Well, I don't want to get into any more. I, I can get into this over and over and over and it's, no, it's not worth it actually because whatever it is it's not being changed and voting no on some of these things does not change a darn thing because I watch uh, Janet you vote no and I watch court right vote no and where we are today wouldn't no matter if you voted yes because as you know three three people overtake everything 
and all these problems we had go back to the last eight years. Not so much this, this four years as you've been on, but the last eight years were terrible as far as the city financing art. And they're continuing to get worse. And there's no hope, I don't think. I really don't. I, I really think the new mayor, when he comes in, whoever it is, is going to sit there and pull off their hair when he sees what, what a terrible mess we're in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Yes, good evening. Um, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is uh, Luis Ramirez. I'm a small business owner in Scranton. Um, my, my concern is uh, prim primarily Southside and Cedar Ave. Uh, there was a, a proposal presented about, f about four years ago um, for the revitalization program. Uh, basically, what they did was they had brought a picture showing how Cedar Ave would look in the next five years and now it's four years later and it doesn't look anything remotely close to the picture that they originally had pre presented us. Um, I had just recently purchased a property on Cedar Avenue and for the last four years I've been um, solely cleaning Cedar Avenue myself uh, from trash and uh, cleaning the gutters and, and trying to remedy the, the, that area. Um, now, with the re revitalization program, uh, supposedly they had received about $250,000. And so far, all I've seen um, done with that money is uh, they've, they're building, they're breaking ground a block away um, instead of building a beautiful uh, arc. Uh, I, I guess they were supposed to put up some kind of uh, arch or something at the beginning of Cedar Avenue that said, welcome to Scranton. Um, that's, that hasn't been done. Um, also, trash cans were supposed to be put in place, and they were supposed to redo the sidewalks with that money. Um, and none of it has been completed. Um, outside of that, I believe that they have done some things on Pittston Avenue, but uh, that wasn't the original um, picture that they, I'm trying to find the actual original picture that they had passed out. Uh, when they first started four, about four years ago. Um, so right now, I, I mean, I just got done mowing uh, somebody else's property. That's, I think it's the city's, um, but uh, it hasn't been maintained since I've been there. I moved from Wilkes-Barre to open a business here. And um, so, you know, this property, I believe that the city owns, uh, you know, there was a fence that was closing it off from people uh, littering and somehow I don't know what happened to the fence but it was take it blew down about two years ago and nobody from the city uh, put it back in place and it just laid there for for a good year and a half two years and uh, then all of a sudden one day I woke up and it was it was gone um, and since then it's just been uh, pretty much a place for for uh, for garbage uh, I mean I don't know if people are driving by and just throwing stuff out the window or, or what's going on, but I clean it once a week and it's, it, every week it's just the same thing over and over again. An easy solution to that would be to uh, just put a couple of nice garbage cans in the, in the area um, and uh, have somebody go down there and clean out the gutters so that way the streets don't uh, fill up with, with water and, and dirt and debris and, and so on and so forth. Also, I, I just real quick, there's... Um, there's no street cleaning, and that's something I'm not used to. I'm from Sunbury, Pennsylvania, and they, they clean the streets once a week there. I mean, it, it's pretty much it's part of their agenda, the city's agenda. And um, it's just a simple matter of asking the people of Scranton to move their vehicles for a day and have a, have a cleaning truck come through and just wash the roads. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Craig, um, could we request um, a written update perhaps from Mr. Hanley concerning the Cedar Avenue project? And uh, also, if we could notify uh, the DPW about that abandoned lot. Um, I think, you know, if, if it is city owned, then it's the city's responsibility to clear it and um, keep it as clean as possible. So if we can send out. Two requests, please. Yes. 
Thank you. Just one more thing. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, one thing I did notice a few weeks ago, they actually uh, did come through at the beginning of Cedar Avenue, and they had trimmed the trees. Um, past the first block, they, didn't, they, they pretty much only did it for about 20 to 30 minutes early in the morning, and then they, they stopped. I'm not sure who's responsible for the trees. But um, past the first block on Cedar Ave, the trees are actually they're hanging down on the power lines. It's, it's unsafe for the buildings and, and so on and so forth. Um, so if, if somebody can do something about Thank that. you. Yes. Mrs. Craig, please incorporate that into the letter as well. And we thank you very much for bringing this information to us. Is there anyone else who cares to address council? Yes, my name is Jack Figured. I'm a resident of Leggett Street, Scranton. And f from myself and all of uh, the working people in the city of Scranton, I'd like to thank each and every one of you council persons for listening to what we had to say. And I'm sure it brought up a lot of discussion with the council and everything on the city of Scranton and the hard recommendation. I'd like to thank you, Mr. McGough, Mr. Rogan, Mrs. Evans. I'd like to thank you, Mr. Joyce, Mr. Loscom. I know it wasn't an easy decision that you came by. It, you, you put the people first in this case. I'm very happy that you did that. I'm hoping it goes forward. There's a lot of people out there that can really use, use the help, and thank you very much for your, for your help. On a low, lighter note, I'd like to thank the woman who sent me a very kind note on Saturday. It's a very thoughtful, well-written, note she wrote that uh, she looks forward to the good things happening in the city of Scranton and she looks forward to working with good honest people that come to this podium and are really trying to do the right thing and I, I, I believe we all did the right thing here I believe all of council did and I think everyone else that supported this project and I'd like to thank you all and thank you to that woman who sent the note thank you thank, thank you, you. Good evening, Council. Doug Miller, Scranton. Uh, I'd first like to start off with uh, agenda item 6C on the agenda, uh, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to uh, disperse 30,000 open Connell Park and Novan Brino uh, swimming pools in time for the uh, 2013 swim season. I think at this point, uh, seeing the date on the calendar, July 11th, I think at this point it's uh, certainly going to be quite unrealistic to expect uh, either one of those pools to open in time. Um, you know, I just the frustration just continues, and I know it's not, you know, council's uh, you know, wrongdoing on any part. I mean, you know, Mr. Joyce and, and, and uh, you know, the administration worked uh, very uh, diligently to get the funding. But, uh, you know, I think when we talk about the uh, reasoning behind it being that we understand there's repairs that need to be made, um, this is something we've known for quite some time, and, and why on July 11th all of a sudden we're, you know, crawling out of our hole announcing the pools need repairs, I think, you know, We've known this for, for many years now, and I don't understand why there's just never any, any sense of urgency with this administration unless it benefits, you know, the elite few in this town. And, you know, it's just another slap in the face to the uh, residents of this city where these children uh, are going to suffer. Um, you know, what we, would, what we would say if it was Nayog that was shut down for each summer, I, you know, we know that would never happen. But, uh, you know, any, anything to benefit the elite few, and I think that's what really frustrates myself and a lot of the residents of this community is, you know, a lot of hardworking people who pay their taxes and, and only ask for little things. You know, garbage pickup, streets plowed the winter, and, and, and certainly to have pools in the summer. And, you know, I really feel sorry for the children in West Side and over in South Side this summer because it's not their fault, obviously. Um, I think we have an administration to thank who, for some reason, just uh, there's never a sense of urgency, and I'm, I'm pretty disgusted over that. I'm just only hopeful moving forward uh, we'll be able to prioritize things a little better and, and realize that the essentials matter. Uh, you know, rather than worrying about taking a care of a certain few. Uh, moving on uh, tonight uh, to 5K, going back to the uh, university project. Just want to re reiterate once again my feelings on this and my uh, staunch uh, opposition to this project. Um, you know, we hear an awful lot about the jobs and, and the $400,000 in permits, but 
I think if we sit back and really analyze this, I, I, I take it in a whole different perspective. I don't think this is about unions. I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, the supporters of this are trying to make this a union issue that we're, we're trying to deny people jobs. Um, let me make it quite clear tonight uh, that for me, my opposition isn't uh, being against union workers uh, having an opportunity in the community. That's certainly uh, you know, false. And, and so I don't want there to be this perception out there that I'm against creating jobs. Um, what I'm trying to let the people out there know is it's my, it's my opinion that I think that we're trying to make this a union issue and we're trying to sort of pin the council in a corner and make it seem as if this council is against created the creation of jobs. And that's simply ludicrous. Uh, anybody that's paid close attention to this council knows quite well uh, that that's, that's not the case. I mean, you've spearheaded many uh, job uh, creation uh, in your three and a half years on council and you've certainly you know, made, made things a lot easier for businesses in this community. So that's certainly something that needs to be clarified. Uh, we talk about the permits, the $400,000. You know, I think in the whole grand scheme of things, it's not even money when you sit and take a look at what that university takes in every year. And I know for many it's, it's comical and, and, and I was made you know, mockery of by my statements, but it's the reality. This issue is about the residents of the city and, and doing what's best for them. You know, we talked about being champions for the people. Well, the best thing we could do is stand our ground and, and object to this piece of legislation. I see no reason why to move forward with this. Um, I don't dislike the university, and I know my comments that I make here repetitively would come across that way. I don't dislike them. I understand they do good things in the community. There's no doubt when you, at the end of the day when you take a look at some of the things they do. They provide some great services. But I look at this at the perspective of I know there's a lot of residents in this community that struggle to pay their bills. And paying their bills every year isn't an option. You know, they don't come to the city each year and say, well, this year I'm going to give you a little something, and then next year decide maybe, you know, a little less and, and so on and so forth. They have to pay their fair share for the services that are provided to them. And when you have an institution that brings in millions and millions of dollars each year, I just don't think it's fair to the, the average, ordinary, hardworking, blue-collar resident of this city. And that's who I look out for. I'm not here to speak on behalf of the University of Scranton. I don't think members of council should be mouthpieces for the university. You were elected to represent the residents of this city. You weren't elected to represent a university. If that's the case, then maybe you're in the wrong profession. Maybe you should go work for them. But you were elected to do a job. And your number one priority is to look out for the little guy. And I know there's three people on this council that have been doing that for quite some time. And so, Mrs. Evans, I'm, I'm asking tonight for your colleagues to join you and stand your ground in objecting to this. This is about the people. This isn't about the university. We need to stop being bullied. You need to stand your ground. There's no hurry on this. Because at the end of the day, the zoning board has to overturn it. And now we see they're being sued. So it just goes to show my point that there's no problem with checks being written out and money being spent. It's time they were held accountable and they pay their fair share. And I ask you to vote no to this. This is about Thank people, you. not the university. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Marie Schumacher, citizen and resident. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Good evening. I, I, will, I hadn't planned on it, but I will speak on the university, um, of which you know I'm against. Uh, it, it's You folks up there are always, or many of you, are against this bite, and, but the next time we're going to be rough. We're going we're gonna to really s turn the screws down, make them comply with their institutional zone. But it's always next time. I think the basic issue here is you, they are obviously on the move. They're going out. They're not going up. And what needs to be done is a whole meeting on what is their institutional zone. I don't want them taking Mulberry Street, obviously, although they're happy to park there free. Uh, but that's, it's the bigger picture. What are their plans for the future? How much more property are they going to take? Wayne Evans, a uh, realtor and member of the HARB, who was not at the meeting when the HARB recommended the uh, approval of this, actually posted to Mr. Rogan's uh, Facebook account saying one of the things they had looked at was keeping that YMCA building at the corner. They had actually had plans for that and not changing that and 
and working around it and maybe taking the other building down that was the dormitory. Um, I, I think that would be far better. But again, it's the bigger problem. Where are they going and how long is this going to go on? And, and as I say, you folks have been, many of you, are somewhat disappointing. It just, it's always next time. Uh, but I do want to speak a little bit. I'll have a chance next week again, hopefully, uh, on fi against 7C. Um, you have, the city is in disrepair, the, the gentleman who was here. We don't have the personnel to maintain the properties we have. And now we're going to take one, one property and take it off the tax rolls. We're going to maintain that lot and have, provide free parking for whatever merchants. While other merchants do have their own parking lots. And, and you have not been, I don't think, dealt fairly with the merchants downtown yet. You have yet to uh, modify file 100 of 2009 that specifies where the parking meters will be, what the time limits will be, uh, what the fees will be, what the hours will be. I don't know why that's been held up. And then you have, I was downtown um, along with Mr. McGough and maybe some of the rest of you on the 3rd of July for the concert and the fireworks. And uh, Pango has what seemed to be very permanent uh, signage on the, on the utility poles. And I stopped and I asked them because I've heard all you have to do is put your smartphone when you leave and, and when you come back you say you're done. I said, can you park for more than two hours? And they said, oh yes. Now file of council 100 of 2009 specifies a two hour limit in most of the downtown. There are 10 hour are parking areas. But question, are they allowing people to park as long as they want on the street? and pay as long as they pay with their with their smartphone you know uh, again what what are the hours going to be are we going to have saturday parking are we going to have night parking i think it's time that you tell the the merchants and the citizens what's going to happen and 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 again taking property off the tax rolls um, and then while we're talking about revenues and missed revenues uh, there's a new newspaper in town. It's the Scranton Independent Gazette. What I have here is the Wilkes-Barre uh, Independent Gazette, which is I want to welcome the Scranton Gazette to town. But the um, the lead story, the headline for last for this month, was taxpayers bankrolling sweetheart deals, and it's about how s this one in particular is about how somebody uh, fell behind in their taxes. It was sold at a private sale. They had, came up with the money, and they weren't allowed to buy it back because this person had been approved by their, whoever their uh, authorizing agency is, but they hadn't been paying taxes. Now, you folks have done the same thing. Uh, three years ago, in last May, you uh, authorized the sale of eight properties on East Mountain to a Robert Kolonkoski, um, not a resident of Scranton, for uh, 40, a total of $49,000 for the sales price. But not only has the 49000 not been received by the city, but they've had it for three years and the taxes aren't paid. So I guess if you're, if you're the right person and know the right people, you can get one of these properties at a private sale and not file the deed, not pay the taxes until you're ready to develop it or to sell it to somebody else. I think it's wrong, I think it's unfair, and we're missing uh, income. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Chris Falls at 930 Columbia Street. Uh, I know this is redundant to you folks because we did have a caucus regarding 7C uh, two weeks ago. But I did want to answer some of the questions that did come up earlier. Uh, we are committed to maintaining and cutting the grass and trimming the hedges on that parking lot. The question came up uh, about the parking and people potentially parking there and going downtown and working with a lot of the engineers on this, including Don King and folks like that within the city. I believe it was agreed upon that they were going to do like a 
eight to five, two hour or one hour limit on that parking. Um, so the main reason for that was to prevent, you know, just folks just beaching their car there for long term. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just wanted to address those couple things. I know we spoke on it at the caucus. I don't know if you folks have any other questions that I could answer while I'm standing here. I'd be more than happy to do so. Um, you did state that you would be maintaining the lot, uh, specifically uh, the landscaping of it. Would that include uh, snow removal as well? To be honest with you, I didn't give that any thought. Uh, I know we were going to maintain the hedges and the grass. Uh, as far as the parking goes, it was designed as such that it would be like Penn Avenue, so it would be pulling parking. Mm -hmm. So it would just be a matter of a snowplow kind of pulling in there. If it was an issue and I needed to have that done, I would do so. Again, I haven't Thank given you. that thought. I gave thought to the grass and the hedges and stuff of that nature. Anyone with questions? Thank you, okay, Mr. Thank Fawcett. Thank you for your time. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Jim Devers. I'm the Associate Vice President for Facilities Operations at the University of Scranton. I'd like to thank the members of the Council for reconsidering the recommendation from the Historical Architectural Review Board that the University be granted a Certificate of Appropriateness. To answer some of the comments that were made this evening by some of the other speakers, I'd like to reiterate what I explained at previous city council meetings regarding the reason for the need to demolish Leahy Hall. <clears throat> the university seriously evaluated the potential for renovating the existing facility. We hired a national consultant, Einhorn, Yaffe, and Prescott, to conduct an extensive evaluation of the building, pro provide a feasibility study, of the two interconnected buildings that make up Leahy Hall. EYP has extensive experience in, in science facilities. In fact, they designed our, our science facility on campus. The study revealed that there are several reasons why we cannot use Leahy Hall. The existing building did not have, does not have enough space. Even though there are two buildings, those two buildings do not have enough space to meet the current modern program requirements of occupational therapy, physical therapy, and exercise science. The existing building could not be expanded vertically for structural reasons as well as building and fire code requirements. The 1907 building is basically a wood frame structure and is not capable of supporting the loads of additional floors added to the top of that building. And of course Leahy Hall, as I said, consists of two buildings and the floors do not match up. A building of this type and use must be accessible given the programs that would be contained in it and the clients that it would serve. Finally, we need the new building to connect to the adjacent building, McGurin Hall, with its related programs of nursing, uh, education, counseling, and health administration. Code issues as well as floor level issues made this virtually impossible. The last meeting of City Council, I was asked to explain the University's urgency in seeking the request for demolition. Currently, our project is approximately two months behind schedule. Any further delays may jeopardize the, new build, the use of the new building for the fall semester of 2015. Our construction manager, Quandell, has revised the timeline to complete the new building so that our students can start using it in the fall of 2015. However, it is quite an aggressive schedule after losing two months. It will result in additional costs to the university because of winter construction and protection that will be required uh, during those winter months for pouring of concrete and things like that. To remain on schedule, we need to begin dem dem demolition of Leahy Hall as soon as possible this summer. Not starting demolition as planned jeopardizes the project timeline. The delay will impact the project's positive economic and job creation benefits and create challenges for accreditation of our highly successful health sciences programs at the university. For these reasons, we urge the members of council to continue their support of the resolution listed as 5K and accept Harb's recommendation for demolition and grant the certificate of appropriateness. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have regarding this, this project or the demolition or certificate of appropriateness. 
I just, yes, sir. I just have a couple quick questions. Uh, when the university purchased this building, was it under the historic registry at that time? I do not believe so, sir. No, we purchased it back uh, before the registry. That was in 1993, I believe. The registry was formed 1993-95. I've been at the university since 1985, and we have owned that building prior to my arrival. So it was not on the registry. Okay. Uh, did the university object to it being on the historic registry at that time, or...? We have no documentation that lists anything. I've looked through the files uh, that we have at the university. I cannot find uh, any documentation that we have ever been notified that the building was put on the historic registry. In fact, it wasn't until we started into the design process that we found out that it was on the city's historic register. Uh, again, I, I, I asked you the question about the urgency last mm -hmm. week, of course. Um, I understand that the plans have been in, in the process for several years for this building. Well, we've been talking about uh, a new building for quite, yes, quite a few years. Yes, sir, we have. Uh, but there were other priorities at the university that took precedence over that, such as the new science building and some other projects that we, we deemed uh, uh, not more important, but of higher priority. And I understand that, but at this time of the construction, you're, <clears throat> you know, you come and you make it look like we're holding the process up. It was just presented to us. And we have some questions that we had to ask. We had to check some situations here. Sure. But with the power of the press and everything, it, it, it makes us look bad, yeah. which is frustrating because we're doing our job, too. I understand that. The university doesn't have any other locations where this building can go. No. Uh, as I stated, sir, um, the need to construct this building adjacent to McGurr Hall is paramount to the success of the programs that are contained in the Penisca College of Professional Studies. These are all health-related sciences and services that we provide. Uh, counseling, uh, health administration, nursing, as I stated, are located in McGurn Hall, and this facility will house occupational ther therapy, physical therapy, and exercise science. Now, when McGurn Hall was designed, wasn't it designed to blend in with this building? Uh, the architectural colors, the, the No, the colors, actually, the colors lines. are different. Actually, there's a, a brown, more brownish brick on that on McGurn Hall than there is. There's more limestone on McGurn Hall. So uh, it, it does complement the building, but it was not I mean, I, I do have communication with, with contractors and stuff through the mm -hmm. years that have done projects with the university, and, and, you know, I do get some feedback on different things, and that was one of the things I was told, and it does appear to the lines and everything. Uh, conform to that. Yeah, so I, when buildings are designed at that time, they usually... if, if they were thinking about this here, ha, have they, uh, again, you, you expressed that you can't utilize the, art, the historic part of the building and tear the rest down and, and in case that wasn't there, were there plans developed that, that did have retain the existing historic part, the 1907 part, with the new, new building? No. There were no plans no. that were done? No. When EYP performed their feasibility study, we, they looked at saving that existing building and, 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 and worked very hard uh, to present us with various plans that would incorporate the programs into that building but would require uh, the addition, the vertical addition of, of floors onto that building. And it was just structurally not feasible to do so because the footings for that existing building would not support the addition of floors up to the top of that building. So they did do some models, they did do some test fits, but they all proved to be uh, uh, unbuildable. And then just, you know, off, off the top of my head, if, you know, if this is approved and, and we have a building like the Scranton Electric Building, say the university or somebody wants to purchase, that's on the historic registry. We've set a precedent now that, uh, you know, just go and Tell them you want to tear it down and build a new building because it's not feasible. I, I just don't understand. We have a historic board here that was here for a reason, to, to preserve our history. Uh, if the university, and I think they're pretty prudent, should have known it was on the historic registry, should have fought it if they didn't want it at that time, but kept it in the meantime. I have nothing, and, and again, the newspapers, the university, everybody's going to lay it on and say, we don't want the guys to have jobs or work or anything like that. It's not that. 
I do love the university. I have several family members that graduated from there and have fantastic jobs because of it. I think they've done a fantastic job in the Hill section. But we can't keep making rules for one entity and not the other, evenly. We have a historic review board, yes. The reason I approved bringing it back up here again was to let us all vote, just like the historic board should all vote. They should have another meeting. Let them all vote and see, because I've gotten a lot of different feedback from them. Do you, do you know that they haven't? That they haven't had another vote? Yes. No, I don't. I, I believe we've uh, asked for their minutes. Have we received any minutes from the historic board? I believe that no. they did, and that they asked the member asked that it be reconsidered, and they voted no. They voted no that it can't be reconsidered. To reconsider it, yes. I received the same information as well from the chair of the HARP. Well, who indicated I, I had received different information that actually a meeting was held. Um, the chairman was not present, nor was the secretary treasurer present, a uh, vote was taken, um, they asked then for that to be followed, and they were ignored by the president as well as the secretary treasurer, they, who refused to respond to emails and calls regarding the matter. At a regular scheduled meeting of the HARB this past Monday, Mr. McGough is correct. The motion, motion was reintroduced by a member of the HARB and was voted down. And I received that information from the chair of the HARB, Mr. Moore. As May far I as, ask? As far as uh, uh, you know, preservation and HARB is concerned, HARB has voted to approve the certificate of appropriateness with conditions. And we were perfectly agreeable to those conditions. There were three conditions, and we are going to work uh, uh, with HARB to incorporate those conditions into the, into the new facility. So basically, they did vote for and make the recommendation for the certificate. I of agree with, with you, those but conditions. they didn't have the full panel as we didn't when we voted initially. And that's why I voted last week to say, yes, okay, if the full panel wants to vote, let them vote. We could change our mind or we could all vote against it, we could all vote for it. But I think it's fair. I, I've heard there's been a lot of division over there, and all I'm asking for is the truth, what the, what the status is with that. And if, if you know, and Mr. McGough, you could snicker, but uh, we know what's been going on in the last few years here, and it's just continuing, and it seems like a big rush in the last six months of this administration to do things. So. Might I ask, uh, yes, this is perhaps a bit unrelated, but the building that the university purchased, I believe, in 2012 at the corner of Adams Avenue. Yes, and, the Adams building. Uh, at the time of purchase, a spokesman for the university was quoted as saying that the university had no plans at that time for that particular building. Since then, has a plan been devised for that building? Yes, right after the purchase of that building, we decided that we would move the uh, uh, Vice President for External Affairs onto the fourth floor of that building. Uh, we would uh, also temporarily relocate the College of Arts and Sciences to the third floor of that building uh, and renovate existing second floor of St. Thomas Hall, which is undergoing construction right now. And we're going to be ready to move the College of Arts and Sciences from the Adlin building to the campus, to the second floor of St. Thomas Hall, and vacate that second floor. We do have uh, of plans of, uh, I'm sorry, the third floor. We do have plans of moving the Vice President for External Affairs from the fourth floor to the second floor, and uh, moving the Vice President for Institutional Advancement and Development from O'Hara Hall onto the third and fourth floors of that building. We are going to keep the lavish salon on the first floor and our small business development center on the first floor as well. And they are paying rent? Yes. That's all I have. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who cares to address council?
Hi, Council. Uh, my name Hi. is Sam Vitrus. I'm the president of I Am Local 2305, representing DPW workers. And on the, tonight's agenda is uh, our collective bargaining agreement that was um, <clears throat> negotiated in good faith between uh, the city, the mayor, and um, our union. Um, <clears throat> as you know, um, I'm an employee a long time with the city, and we've come a long way um, in regards to relations with um, city council, with previous mayors, and it's important that labor, management, city council, um, the taxpayers, everyone's represented in the collective bargaining agreement. And it's very important to realize that last year, probably around this time, we were making 725 an hour. And through cooperation between um, Scranton City Council, the mayor, and the employees, I feel that we've come a long way. Um, everything's not perfect. It'll never be perfect. But um, I think it's important that we keep trying and that um, the management, the politicians, the taxpayers, everybody um, realizes that labor negotiations aren't easy. And um, our contract, this contract, represents um, our knowing that the city's financial situation um, isn't the best. And it probably won't be for quite some time. We realize that. And if you look through it, you'll see next year there is no raise for public works employees. Um, it's very uh, minimal contract. And um, we would just appreciate a yes vote so that our um, labor management relations can continue um, with the next mayor going into um, the future. So um, I would hope that um, the city's finances do get better beginning, um, well, starting this year and hopefully continuing on into um, the next years. So I would just want to say thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ventress. Is there anyone else? Hello, Council. Hello. Good evening. Yeah, what would a meeting be without Ronnie inflicting his sad tears? You know, my friends, I think we got a terrible cancer growing in our midst. That's the University of Scranton. And, and, and all this unscrupulous, greedy bunch that oversee it. I, I read letters of their supporters like this this week. The man, is he, he works for them and he lives in Clark Summit. But he, he makes a threat that they ought to withhold their little measly amount of money that they contribute to the city if we don't give in to their whims. You know, probably in 50 years, the minute amount of money they've given the city would be absolutely nothing compared to what they've taken off our tax rolls. I don't, I don't know how somebody could even think, think something like that. What we desperately need is some simple, practical law. What we have is a dismal pill in, in Mr. Cross that haven't done nothing except collect salaries. I think, I think we're very fortunate to have this program and, and have Ms. Evans and her, her administration keep it on the air when, when uh, 
the Doherty administration tried repeatedly to remove it. I read the paper just, they rearrange facts about everything. That's a good word. I, I don't know how to say things sometimes, but they rearrange stuff. It's just, it's just blatant lies. A couple of weeks ago that said, there was an article about uh, them not taking property that's been taxed and so on, which was just an outright blatant lie. To me, what's really a question here is the future of Scranton. The state must be brought into this local problem we have of, of, of this unbearable taxation for many. We need some laws against these organized benefactors of, of the loopholes. I, I keep going back to that th these universities, if they generate $400 million, they can't be nonprofit. There's another organization here that has over 50 pieces of property, all tax free. The, the, the city's fourth examples like that. I, I, I don't know why the state can't be brought in and, 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 and do something to help the people of the city that are being taxed out of their houses. You know, sometimes people just don't want to hear about something that they just don't want to happen. To me, there's just like a, a big bear coming down the road that's going to devour the city. We can't go on taxing people out of their homes. You know, there's 3,000 people out there, and I've talked to some of them that lost their homes. And there's nothing more sad than right across the street, a lady stopped me last year. She lived in a home that was paid for and couldn't afford it no more. You know, it's... I, I'd like to sell my house and leave, and I've had so many people tell me <laughs> not to give up. <laughs> I guess... I guess I'll pay my taxes before the year's out and, and stick it out like I should. But you people just have got to put your foot down and, and draw the line against the university. I think you've tried. But like I said, they just rearrange facts to suit themselves, and it's always us against them. And somehow things get turned around where they're the victim of it all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is David Hemler. I'm an architect in the city of Scranton. I've practiced here for approximately 35 years in uh, three different locations in the city. Uh, I'd like to speak for a few minutes about uh, the objectivity of the historic property um, and to perhaps establish some credibility to the design team, which I happen to head for that project. As Jim Devers mentioned, we took the Einhorn study and reviewed it, but also uh, uh, studied it somewhat ourselves relative to could the building be economically saved. Before I, before I do that, let me just establish a little bit about our history uh, as a firm, myself, my partners. Some of the buildings that we've been uh, responsible for in the city of Scranton are the very one you're sitting in in the late 1970s when the city was going to tear this building down and build a new building, Caddy Corner, where the housing project is, we had worked for a firm called Belanti and Klaus. We pretty much did an after hours effort to save this building and it was saved. And it is a, wonder, it is a wonderful building, 
perhaps uh, in spite of some people that don't like to speak close enough to microphones. The city, the city of Scranton Firehouse, the main firehouse, just replacing the windows. The firehouse on Petersburg Corners, the firehouse in Southside. The Steamtown National Park, one, I think one of the jewels of the city. The Scranton Prep School, again, a historic property that was renovated and added to. And saved Central High School. When the school moved out and built a new building, we in instigated an effort to s with Ray Angeli to save that building and uh, keep it as part of the city, the CYC. St. Peter's Cathedral, St. Anne's Basilica, the GIR building, a building that we occupied for many years, the Brooks Building, the Bozak Bank Building, the Lackawanna Station we did numer numerous study studies for, the Lackawanna Courthouse, the uh, Veterans Plaza and ro roof work, the Scranton Federal Courthouse Building, Marywood University of the Liberal Arts Historic Dome and Rotunda, Marywood Science Building, the original building on campus. St. Joseph Center, the main building. The Jersey Central train station, numerous studies. St. Clair's Church. The University of Scranton houses on Clay Avenue. The University of Scranton main estate. The University of Scranton Houlihan McLean, the performing arts center. The Cathedral Prayer Garden. The Lackawanna Laundry Building. The Children's Library. The Scranton Public Library, St. Matthew's Church, St. Stanislaus Polish Cathedral, the Cathedral High Schools, Scranton, um, um, Southside's uh, Catholic uh, High School, which was turned into a housing, the Scranton State School of the Deaf, for the Deaf, Covenant Presbyterian Historic Windows, the Scranton Lace Building, numerous studies, the Trolley Museum, the Smurfit Building, I was on the team that helped us establish a historic district in the town of Waverly. St. John's of Main Avenue, which unfortunately later was torn down. Uh, St. Thomas More Church in Archibald received a, a, a state award from the American Institute of Architects. St. Luke's Parish House, Elm Park Church, the Colonnade Building, the Adlin Building, the 500 block of Lackawanna Avenue, and numerous storefront and beautification projects. Additionally, on Courthouse Square, there's a plaque that uh, celebrates the, the lifetime of achievement of Peter Bolin, who happens to be my uh, colleague on the project. And if you will, my, this project it would be a signature building that might establish history, having a Peter Bolin, who, who was the 2010 AIA gold medal recipient, uh, to have a project that he's, he's uh, been involved in in Scranton. Finally, and, or I should say additionally, another project architect is Richard Leonori, a lifelong preservationist in the city of, in the city of Scranton, and historian through the city, original member of AHA, original mem member of your HARB, uh, instructor of architectural history, member of the State Historic uh, Art, Art, Architecture and Museum Commission, and as I said, a member of HARB. This is a quality team. We haven't taken tearing this building down lightly. We've taken it very seriously. It, it just does not work economically. I hope this addresses our credibility. Thank you. Can I Thank just you. ask a quick question? Oh, yes. Mr. Hemler. Or Hemler. You named those buildings that you were able to save. Mm -hmm. Do you have the names of any buildings that you ended up having to tear down that weren't salvageable? I, I didn't write that as a list, but yes, there were. And Mr. Lenore, you said, is a member of HARB, and he's also a member of the design team. That's correct, right? Yes. Okay. I know Mr. Lenore personally. I've mm -hmm. known him a long time. But uh, I, I don't know if he voted on this or not. I believe he, so. He abstained conflict. from voting because of his involvement in the project. He didn't okay. think that that would be appropriate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Council, Roger Leonard, DPW, heavy equipment operator. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I actually just wanted to answer uh, a couple of things the gentleman said early about uh, the trees being in the power lines. I believe I forget the address that it was in. 
we are actually not able to do them in the power lines just to know it's PPNL's responsibility to, to bring them down below the power lines and we take them from there. So I just want to let you know that that's the reasoning for that. I mean, when they come out, once they, we get the, uh, the addresses and then we take them down from there. And uh, the sweeper program, he said about uh, his street not being able to be sweeped. The problem usually is that you know how close the houses are and how many you know, cars there are on a block. There's really not the parking to be able to take them and move them and there's no driveways for people to pull in. So what we try to do is we try to go in the morning, get in and out as we can, and when people leave, you know, we try to go when they're at work. But it's difficult because people have different hours, so we do have a sweeper out, and we do hit the streets, it's just hard. There's no way we'd be able to move mm -hmm. all the cars. There's just not the parking for it. So I just want to let you know that I answer those two things. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Mrs. Craig? 5A motions. Councilman McGough, do you have any comments or motions tonight? Yes, and hopefully briefly. Um, first, I wanted to ask Mr. Lasco, I don't know if you, uh, I had a complaint from a, a citizen about, I think they're called airsoft guns. I don't know that you, if you have heard. Uh, apparently they're, they're like little air pistols that shoot small plastic, I'll call them BBs. And I guess they can shoot them, you pump them up somehow and they shoot them. Um, and they can be, I guess, dangerous if um, close. And, and I was also talking to a member of the county sheriff's office and he said that many of them are made to look like actual Real gun. guns that can be very problematic um, but um, I, I don't know if uh, and I'm also told that there are some communities that have set regulations on, on using these so um, I, I wasn't sure if you had heard of anything yeah, no, or that was any the first I've heard from, about it but, I, I, but I, I think I have an idea what you're speaking of but uh, I haven't heard anything about them or, or actually seen any but Okay. Um, Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll present that to the police chief, and maybe we can come up with some kind of an ordinance together. Well, I, I'm not even, you know, something it's just not even safety. about an ordinance. It's just whether, it, whether there has been a problem in the city with, you know, that the police have identified. And sure. if, if there is, then is there something that, that we, could, we can do to alleviate that problem? Okay. Um, and the second Thank thing, I, I don't know if it comes under public safety or where it comes. Um, a complaint about advertising being placed on utility poles uh, and the most common apparently it is a violation and the the one that they spoke of was the I think it's we buy homes those signs are everywhere and they're being placed on you know utility poles and apparently that's a violation and um, Perhaps we should start to consider the idea that you know maybe at least warn people that that's not something that they should do and that those signs sh will be removed. I think um, too. Did Miss Schumacher? There's someone this evening who spoke indicated that Pango was advertising on utility poles. What? Was it on utility poles or on the? Uh, I think the Pango is on the meter heads. On the meter head. I, that's they what have, I thought. They have signs also that I saw in the downtown. But but anyhow, uh, it, it's. I, I guess the the problem was that if we allow people to place signs on utility poles, then you know we're going to fill. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. Poles will be filled with them, and uh, it's just something to uh, consider that. And I don't know who would um, actually monitor that that, um, that problem. Um, another thing that somebody asked me about, and I, and I didn't know the answer to, uh, since we have the legislation on the handicap parking signs uh, being removed or you know whatever, um, was there anything? I don't know if anybody would remember that these could be transferable. Uh, one lady asked that her husband or her father had gotten a sign placed in front of their house 
Her father has since passed away, but yet her husband does have a handicap sticker on his car. Now, is that sign going to be removed because it was in her father's name, or can they simply keep the sign there and uh, you know transfer it to the you know to the husband? And, and I don't remember if that was done or not. Maybe it's something that I, maybe um, uh, they could contact. Um, police department and pose the question thank you mm -hmm. uh, yes I, I guess that would be the best way I, I, as far as the gentleman spoke about Cedar Avenue uh, the Cedar Avenue revitalization program was uh, like a three-phase program and I'm not sure where his business was or what area he was talking about but the the phase that they're now working on is the 500 block of Cedar Avenue, and they've done extensive work in that block. I mean, there's they've cleared cleared buildings, and now they're in the construction phase of, I believe, it's uh, apartments um, in that area and some storefronts. So, the the revital, you know, UNC's revitalization project is something that's ongoing. It, it's not something that's you know non-existent, and that the next phase is to move to the 600 block of Cedar. I get the impression that the gentleman was talking about closer to um, the entrance uh, to, to the city. Yeah, to the downtown area that the, that enter or to the 81 entrance and all. And I don't think there was ever anything in that project. I'm trying to remember seeing it. I don't ever remember them is talking about going that far into the one or 200 blocks of Cedar Avenue. So maybe I'm wrong. Uh, but uh, that project is an ongoing thing and, and has been very um, um, kind of vital to the redevelopment of that, those couple of blocks in, in Southside. And um, as far as the other thing, I'll wait until we get to the legislation. It's a busy evening, so thank you. Thank you, thank and you. Councilman Rogan. Yes, thank you. I'll be very brief. Um, currently, I have a lot of comments on many agenda items tonight. Um, just a couple things I wanted to mention. Um, there was an article in the paper regarding the condition of recent Greenbush streets, and I do agree that with the mayor with trying to get um, the other institutions to donate some money to the city to repair those roads, um, to repave them. Um, but in the meantime, I would hope that they are re repa repaired. Um, I received some pictures from a resident from the area, and there are some areas right in front of people's homes that are um, there are almost craters there, and I understand they're very long streets with a lot of water runoff, so I imagine um, keeping the maintenance there is difficult. But Mrs. Craig, if we could please send a letter to the DPW director and the mayor um, asking that they're at least repaired in the meantime, and hopefully an agreement will be made to have them permanently re repaved. Um, one other issue, um, the pools. Now I understand we have legislation on the agenda tonight to appropriate money for repair. And uh, I've, one of the speakers mentioned that they, they thought it was unlikely that they would be open this year. Um, and I know we discussed last week that we would hope that the money would be used, even if it were to repair them to open the, pre the next year. Um, but I did hear a story, and I don't know how true it is, um, from some city employees that the director, the mayor and the director of the DPW have removed parts from some of the pools that were closed to other pools. Um, to keep them up and running, one of them being Novembrino Pool in Westside, um, which is one of the, there's actually two pools in that complex, and West Granton's the biggest part of the city, and in Westside we've been without a pool for years. I know Kapaus Avenue, there's talks about not even reopening it. Um, I would like to know if parts actually were removed from any of the pools and moved to other pools. I don't think the mayor can be picking and choosing what ones we're going to open, um, opening smaller pools instead of larger pools. I think we need to, to work to get at least one in the Novembrino complex open this year um, for, the, for the residents of Westside. Um, so Mrs. Craig, if we could please also send that to the DPW director and the mayor, um, asking what the status is and if any parts, specifically pumps, were removed um, from any pool, city pools. And like I said, I have numerous comments coming up on agenda items, but I will hold off until that time. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilman Loscombe, do you have any comments or motions tonight? 
Uh, <clears throat> no, I don't have anything at this time. I'll just uh, make some comments during motion, during uh, votes. Thank you. Thank and you. Councilman Joyce, do you have comments or motions? Just a few. Um, as you know, there was an article in the newspaper about uh, the Pango app and smart parking. And I'm very uh, encouraged to see that uh, smart parking is uh, becoming successful in the city of Scranton. Also, I would like to uh, thank uh, Mr. Vitrus for coming in tonight um, to talk about the uh, DPW contract. I, um, for, from my knowledge of the contract, it's a very fair contract. And I think that um, the DPW is uh, doing their best and they're uh, putting forth a good effort to be a good partner with the city. Uh, they're taking a pay freeze in year one, and their uh, raises thereafter are are fairly minimal. And I would say probably just in line or below uh, the national average, so I will be voting for that. Um, also, we had some uh, information relayed to us from Northeast Revenue uh, from June 1st to June 30th, as you know, Northeast Revenue collects delinquent real estate taxes uh, for all prior years besides um, uh, 2012, which is collected by the single tax office. And for the period of June 1st to June 30th, um, the, our Northeast Revenue uh, collected and distributed $119,032.95 to the city. And for the period of June 1st to June 30th, um, Northeast Revenue uh, collected delinquent refuse payments as well, as we know they, they do that. And they collected 83951 Just to update everyone, and I know this is a um, uh, a big issue, the maintenance of traffic signalization. Uh, we received a, a, a letter from uh, our purchasing clerk to inform us that bids were opened on Monday, July 8th in council chambers for the maintenance of traffic signalization. And there were two bidders being Urban Electrical and Joyce Electrical, which I am not a relation of. Uh, after um, the uh, director of the DPW, Mr. Mark Dewar, reviews these bids. He will select, uh, hopefully, the lowest responsible <coughs> bidder. So once, uh, once we receive information as to who that is, I will uh, further inform everyone who uh, will be responsible for the traffic signal, uh, or for maintenance of traffic signalization. Uh, I do have some comments uh, for the agenda items tonight, but I will save those for the votes, and that's all. Well, <laughs> at this time, our president, uh, uh, Miss, uh, Mrs. Janet Evans, has stepped out. Uh, probably to use the uh, facilities but um, brief recess uh, for, yeah I'll, I'll make a motion that we take a brief recess for a, a minute or two until she gets back second all in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. Mm -hmm. oh. So, what's, did you take a recess or something? Yeah.
Yeah, we just took a brief recess. At this time, the meeting will resume. Uh, good evening. Because of the unusual length of our agenda, I will refrain from motions and comments at this time in order to progress directly to fifth order legislation for introduction. Mrs. Craig, please begin. 5B. Approving the transfer of a restaurant liquor license currently owned by Great Uncle Peter's LLC, 1582 Newton Ransom Boulevard, Clark Summit, Pennsylvania, 18411, Newton Township. License number R-2782 to Tara Preta, LLC, for use at 222 Wyoming Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania, as required by the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5B be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? Uh, next week at 5.45 p.m., City Council will conduct a public hearing regarding the transfer of this liquor license. All those in favor of introduction, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5C, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials of the city of Scranton to accept and disperse grant funds from the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency Voluntary Fire Company and Volunteer Ambulance Services Grant awarded to the city of Scranton Fire Department. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5C be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5D, amending file of council number 77, 2012, in ordinance entitled General City Operating Budget 2013 by transferring funds not to exceed $75,000 from account number 01401130904299 non-departmental operating expenses contingency to account number 01040000404250 business administration dash advertising to provide funding for delinquent refuse and rental registration advertising costs. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5D be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question, all those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. The ayes have it and so moved. 5E, creating and establishing special city account number 02229606 entitled Paving Project-Pennsylvania Gaming Act for the receipt and disbursement of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania acting through the Commonwealth Financing Authority for a local share account grant in the amount of $2,044,000 for paving the streets throughout the city of Scranton. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5E be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question. Yes, would we be able to request um, a paving list from the administration? I looked in the backup, I didn't see one attached, and hopefully, if it's not complete yet, the council could have some input in that as well, because I know we all have mm -hmm. a list of our own. Mrs. Craig, if you would please send a memo tomorrow. Anyone else on the question? All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5F, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials for the city of Scranton to agree to extend the maturity date of the $1,163,500 subordinate loan made to Scranton Mall Associates from be December 12th, 2011 to December 31st, 2013 with the understanding that the maturity date of said subordinate loan could be further extended at the discretion of Penn Star Bank to July 11, 2025 to accommodate a restructuring of Penn Star Bank senior loan, thus avoiding or foreclosure of the Penn Star Bank senior loan and certain loss of the city's subordinate loan. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5F be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? Yes, on the question. Um, would we be able to have a caucus or some sort of meeting with folks from Penn Star Bank and um, basketball mall associates 
it seems every year that something's on the legislate something's on the agenda regarding um, the Steamtown Mall not being able to make their payments. Um, I would like a little more information. I will vote yes this week um, to move it along, but I would hope that we could have a sit down like we did last time a similar issue came up. Uh, Mrs. Craig, if you want to see if uh, a public caucus can be arranged for next week, perhaps at uh, 515, and if they're unable to attend on that date, we can schedule for the following uh, Thursday, which I believe is the 25th, and uh, for a starting date of, or a starting time of uh, 515. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5G authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to execute and enter into a collective bargaining agreement with Local Lodge 2305 of the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers in accordance with the terms and provisions of a memorandum of understanding dated May 30th, 2013 and ratified by the membership. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5G be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. Second. On the question. Yes, on the question. Um, looking through, I, I do agree that the changes that are being made to the previous contract are minimal. Um, I do believe that the next mayor should have the opportunity to have some say in this contract since he or she will be the one living with it. Um, I oppose passing this currently. Um, I do know that the changes that were made were basically just on two items specifically, one being the pay, the other being um, the city's pension contributions. I would have liked to see an increase pension contributions from the DPW employees and as well as the elimination um, of, the no, of the no privatization clause for the refuse division. I'd just like to comment. I literally have run into two different crews uh, out working uh, in the past couple of weeks. Uh, one who were out uh, doing some pothole um, repairs or filling in some potholes, others collecting. And I think that uh, the gentlemen that work, uh, the people who work for DPW are um, doing a great job with, uh, with the many services that they need to provide or that they have to provide for the city. And I'm happy to um, vote for this uh, contract. Uh, and the only thing that I might add is that, yes, it would be ideal if the next mayor were able to contribute to the negotiation of this contract, but in that same vein, then could we not say it would also be very advantageous to have the new mayor involved in all the major issues that face the city from now until his swearing in in January of 2013. There's financing on the table for the payment of police and fire. Um, there's a, a budget forthcoming. There are issues with Pell. So it would seem, uh, you know, if he were going to be involved in this, which isn't a bad idea, then I would say he should be involved in everything. Well, uh, unlike some of the issues that are going to come up between now and then, um, we, we won't have a mayor elected until November. Um, so that, that will provide two months. The issues that come up between now and then, um, there's still another election. Um, just my opinion, and some other people have mentioned to me that they were, and they were concerned that this administration was going to push through um, a number of items in the, the waning, the lame duck period, and this looks to me to be one of them. Anyone else? I'd just like to reiterate my, uh, my feelings on the DPW contract. I think it's a fair contract. I think that the, uh, the membership of the DPW deserves to have a contract. And I believe that they're all hardworking people. They do a great job throughout the city with the many services that they provide. And they're taking a pay freeze in year one and the raises are, are pretty minimal, I would say, compared to uh, many other uh, unions throughout the city. So 
I will be happy to vote for this. All those in favor of introductions signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. The ayes have it and so moved. 5H authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to accept grant funds from the Department of Environmental Protection DEP Act 101 Recycling Program Performance Grant in the amount of $34,488 for the City of Scranton Recycling Program. At this time I'll entertain a motion that item 5H be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question. All those in favor of introductions signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5 I, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to accept grant funds from the Department of Environmental Protect Protection DEP Act 101 Recycling Program Performance Grant in the amount of $80,283 for the City of Scranton Recycling Program. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5I be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question. All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5J, accepting a donation of three Opticom units from the Board of Amos Towers presented to the City of Scranton Fire Department. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5J be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question. Just on a question, if, if anybody uh, doesn't understand what they are, uh, we're on J, right? Yes. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> uh, the Opticom units are uh, devices that are in the fire trucks. If you notice the new uh, traffic signals that are in place, they mm -hmm. have like a reflector on them. This is a system that they could press into trucks for safety to activate the, the green lights. So it eliminates the possibility of someone coming through a red light or green light this way and a fire truck going through a red light. Uh, some of the newer trucks came equipped with them, but the older trucks have not had them. And I believe they're about $1,200 a piece. So mm -hmm. this is a nice contribution. Yes, and Absolutely. on behalf of council, I wish to thank the board of Amos Towers for this very, very generous donation to the city of Scranton's police, or yes. excuse me, fire department. All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5K, accepting the recommendation of the Historical Architecture Review Board and approving the Certificate of Appropriateness for the University of Scranton, 800 Linden Street, Scranton, Pennsylvania, for demolition of Leahy Hall to include courtesy review by the HARB for public incorporation of the Linden Street Portico, public recognition of the 1907 building via exhibit photo and text, including acknowledgement of the YWCA building and its role in the city at 630 Linden Street and 235 Jefferson Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5K be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. Second. On the question? I guess I'll start. <laughs> I would first like to start off by thanking my colleagues, um, Mr. Lasco, Mr. Joyce, and Mr. McGough for second, seconding and supporting my motion last week to bring this back up for another vote. This is a very critical vote for the city of Scranton and for the University of Scranton and for the workers of Scranton. There are many issues at play here. For me, the most important ones are jobs and revenue for the city of Scranton. I know some that oppose this plan make the argument that the jobs that are going to be created are temporary jobs, when in fact all construction jobs are temporary. Eventually, every project would hopefully come to an end when it's completed. But this project will provide years of work for hundreds of hardworking men and women in Scranton and in Northeast PA. It will also generate over $400,000 of revenue for the city. And most importantly, it allows the University of Scranton to expand without taking more property off the tax rolls, which is something that's very important. I believe the University of Scranton should expand up and not out. And in this scenario, they're tearing down their own building to build higher. As I stated in the newspaper and at council meetings previously, 
this project is a home run for the city. It brings in revenue for the city of Scranton. It creates jobs for the hardworking men and women who need them. And it does it all without removing any property off the tax rolls. For those reasons, I am very proud to vote yes for this. And I will do anything I can to see this project come to fruition. If I, I just may uh, add to my comments earlier. If the university, I had wished they had gone to Harb and asked them to remove the declaration of, of a historic registry. That would have been the easiest possible way. Um, they didn't do that. Then it's laid on our lap to decide to tear down a, a historic building. That's not something that I, I feel I could decide. I would hope to see a compromise to preserve the city's historic building. After all, the university has constructed on a full lot on the corner of Jefferson and Mulberry Street a sign that states the historic hill section. I would like them to keep that in mind and, and, and try and devise something around the history of that building. And we have to understand the historic part of that building is only a small section. It's not that whole building. It's only the 1907 building that's designated historic. The 1920s building is not. They could tear down that, they could tear that down right now without our approval. But I think it would be setting a precedent for us, as I stated before, for other developers coming in to say, hey, you know, I'm going to take over, like I said, the electric bu city building. I don't have the list of, of what's on the registry, but to those owners right now, if you don't want to be on the registry, I would go to Harb and, and ask to be off of it. For anybody that's been on it and didn't realize it, I find that hard to believe too. But, um, you know, it's part of our history. It's been that designation. We have a, a, a historic board that, in this case, I don't believe they did their duty. I don't believe they did their duty because they didn't take a second vote. They didn't open it up to the full body. I voted to open it up to the full body. That didn't mean that I'm changing my vote. I could be construed as an obstructionist by the newspaper. That's fine. They've called me a lot worse through the years. That doesn't bother me. And I'm not against labor. This is not a labor employment issue. This is the University of Scranton and a historic building. Maybe the newspaper could get that straight, or somebody. But when they come here, I don't know how else to say this, and try and bully us into making a decision because of, of using certain innuendos as obstructionists, as against labor, as against permits, and stuff like that. There's going to be other construction projects in this city this year. And the university also, right now, it's going to litigation. So that may take some time. If they've had this project on the, on the paper for five years, they should have come to us in December or January before the building season. That's my take on it. Don't put us against the wall and say we're, we're losing time. So either way, right now, we're losers anyway. Because it's going to court, apparently it's being appealed on a zoning issue, but the timetable is not going to allow you to, to construct a new building because I don't know how fast the court can rule on that. But apparently you're right at the limit at this point. And, you know, I'm a little guy. I'm David, you're Goliath. And I've seen a lot going on in my four years here that I don't like. And unfortunately, you may not be part of that, but it seems in the last couple months, I've come upon a lot of stuff, especially when it comes to buildings, permits, and zoning. And I have a lot of questions. In fact, while I'm on that, I, I forgot, Mrs. Craig, Mr. Wallace was unable to come here to our caucus because he was on vacation. This is not a university issue, but, but Pardon me because it, it came up. I have several issues with building permits being issued or authorized without going through zoning or proper procedures. And this has been ongoing. 
So this is my fear. This, is, this has been an ongoing problem. And unfortunately, in my case, this is falling into that category. We're pushed against the wall when this didn't happen overnight, and I'm not going to be bullied into making a decision overnight on something. I think HARB should get together, vote on it as a full body like we are, and, and go from there. If our body votes in favor of this, I'm in favor of it. But personally, personally I can't. I mean, we're usurping the rules here. So that's where I stand. Thank you. Uh, HARB has voted twice to approve this um, certificate of appropriateness. They voted once to approve it, and they vo voted once to not um, reconsider the vote. We can quibble about not reconsidering was, it isn't a vote. They did vote. It was asked to be put back for a vote, and it was voted down. We can quibble about who was at those meetings. They were two legally, they were two meetings um, with the quorum, um, votes taken by HARB, within, taken within their bylaws or within their operating procedures. Um, to, to question and, and to say we have to wait for other people to vote on it is to me, senseless. Uh, HARB voted. All we're being asked to do is to reaffirm their vote. As far as the zoning board is concerned, we're getting into a chicken and egg argument about whether the zoning board should go first or whether we should vote first. This isn't, we should see this as an isolated issue, vote on it, not based on things that have happened in the past or something that might happen in the future. Is this project something that is beneficial to the city and is something that should move forward? I have yet to hear any argument where somebody has said that this particular project is going to have a negative impact on either the city or the citizens of this city. If there's no negative impact, then there's absolutely no reason to not vote for it. And that's your opinion. It, you say there's no negative impact, we're losing a tell piece me, of history. Tell me, what, tell me something that's negative about this particular project. I just explained, a compromise would be ideal. That would appease everyone. You still haven't told me something negative. I'm in favor of the project, but just do it the right way. <laughs> it's being I can't done say the anything right way. negative about it, but I'm not going <laughs> to rule on tearing something down, a piece of history that's, you know, that, that, that I don't Harb approve. That has of. said they you're, would approve. We don't have the minutes from the Harb meeting, which we requested. So obviously, you're oh. the only one that has access to Harb. I would, I would like one of the members of Harb to come here and speak to us. Well, yeah, I think perhaps you'd need more than one because they're evidently appears to be two divided and separate camps within HARB. So I think um, hearing from one individual will only present the perspective of that camp. So you would That's need true. both. So how do we resolve that? I mean, they're I, divided. I, would, I don't think they're, they're fully. I would add that if, if we do approve this this week, it will be up for another vote next week. Members of the HARB, and I've, I spoke to one of the members who I disagree, who disagrees with my opinion on this, and I did hear him out. Um, by moving it forward to next week for a final vote, that would give members of HARB that are happy with the vote or unhappy with the vote another chance to come and speak um, in front of council. So far, nobody has. Um, I do know, like I said, I have had one member well, reach out to me, um, and I spoke to him. Again, it's David against Goliath, so there's a lot of people that are intimidated too, but you know, I will give you that. I will give you that. I will vote to pass it along and, uh, you know, make my decision next week. And hopefully we will have someone here that ex it can explain what the division is on HARB and, and what the story is. Great. That's my holdup. Um, I'm going to be very, very brief. 
for next week's meeting, I ask my colleagues, my honorable colleagues, to consider this question. Why must the benefit of the few frequently be placed among or before the benefit of the many? When it is the purpose of government to do the greatest good for the greatest number and to harm the smallest number. But, you know, from what I've seen in 10 years, and those 10 years are quickly coming to an end. I've seen quite a bit that I will never forget. And the truth of the matter is, the few are often placed and chosen before the many. And that is not good governing. Who are the many there, that are being hurt by this? I was going to say, we have yet to hear anything negative about this particular project. Nobody is being harmed. We have uh, representatives <laughs> of the university and the um, building trades who are in favor of this project, quite obviously for their personal, or I shouldn't say personal, but their individual reasons. It's to their benefit. When we listen to many of the people who actually reside in Scranton, pay taxes, they appear to be opposed to this project. So are we working for the few or are we working for the many? I believe three people spoke against the project this week and about the same spoke out in favor of it. The union leaders that came to us reside, I believe they all reside in the city of Scranton. And many of the union workers also reside in the city of Scranton. The city brings in revenue from this without taking if this property was, if this was a purchase of a property off the tax rolls, I would likely agree with what you just said. But since the taxpayer is not being hurt in any way, shape, or form by this project, it will bring in money for the city and create jobs. I, I don't see, as M Mr. McGough said, anything, any negatives with this particular project. But I'm looking forward to another vote next week and hearing from, from more residents. And I, I mean, I, I, on top of the people who spoke here, I have received a number of uh, calls and emails, as Mrs. Evans stated, that, uh, that are the other way. But, you know, it's intimidating for people to come here to this podium. And we have to listen to the taxpayers and what, what is in the best interest. Again, yes, there's no negative to this. It is a positive, but it's a positive if it's done the right way to benefit everybody. And that's not the way it's being done. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we <laughs> obviously we have opposing opinions on this particular piece of legislation. And I think we should, rather than denigrating um, one another's sides, let's just agree to disagree. And all those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. The ayes have it and so moved. Bob <coughs> appointing Joseph Gilholy, 952 North Webster Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18510, as an alternate number two member to the Board of Zoning Appeals for the City of Scranton. Mr. Gilholy will replace Dominic Giorgetti, whose term expired on July 1, 2013. Mr. Gilholy's term will commence on July 2, 2013 and expire on July 1st, 2015. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5L be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? Yes, this is my appointment. Um, <coughs> I would just like to say that Mr. Gilholy submitted his letter of interest. He actually called me on, on the phone as well as uh, he, well, he told me he was calling other council members as well to express his interest in the zoning board. And I think it's important that we have folks on the zoning board who are interested in the board and are interested in doing a good job. And I think that he will fulfill the role of uh, an alternate uh, very, very greatly. Anyone else? 
All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5N, reappointing Charlie Spano, 718 Stafford Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18505, as an alternate number one member to the Board of Zoning Appeals for the City of Scranton. Mr. Spano's term expired on July 1, 2013, and his new term will commence on July 2, 2013, and expire on July 1, 2015. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5M be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? Yes, Mr. Spano was um, my reappointment to the zoning board. Uh, Mr. Spano has served as an alternate for the last few years on the zoning board and um, wish him well in another term. All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 6A, reading by title, file of council number 33, 2013, an ordinance, amending section 340-1, 340-8, 340-9, and 340-13A of the code of the city of Scranton, governing peddling and soliciting within the city of Scranton. You've heard reading by title of item 6A. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6A pass reading by title. Second. Second. <laughs> On the question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 6B, reading by title, file of council number 34, 2013, an ordinance establishing the duties, responsibilities, and qualifications of the city health inspector, providing for the payment of an annual license fee for public eating and drinking establishments within the city of Scranton establishing annual application and renewal requirements, imposing certain duties upon the Director of Licensing, Inspections, and Permits, and the City Health Inspector, providing guidelines for revocation and reinstatement of licenses, and providing for imposition of penalties. You've heard reading by title of item 6B. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6B pass reading by title. Second. On the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 6C, reading by title, file of council number 35, 2013, an ordinance authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to disperse $30,000 from the account into which repayment of urban development action grants, UDAG, are deposited, UDAG repayment account, for the Connell Park and Novembrino swimming pools to be opened in time for the 2013 swim season. You've heard reading by title of item 6C. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6C pass reading by title. Second. On the question? Just on the question, uh, I, I think it was stated in the newspaper, obviously, that they won't be opening these pools, that they didn't have enough money. Um, if, if that's the case, when it comes up next week, I'll be, I would vote to put this back into a, into a fund other than to be used for those two pools since they're not going to be utilized this year. Or perhaps it could be uh, amended to indicate that the, the funds that are transferred would be used for repair of specified neighborhood pools for a proposed opening in June 2014. Exactly. That's what my thought was, to, to push it to, if Absolutely. it's not going to happen. It will Otherwise, it will be spent and, and nothing will happen. Yeah. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. And uh, if we could request uh, our solicitor to perhaps draft an amendment to item 6C for next week's meeting, please. Sure. And uh, one addendum to that, mm -hmm. too. Per perhaps we could find out if, in fact, Novembrino and Connell Park are not able to be opened. Perhaps we could get an estimate of what it would cost to repair so that we so that we would know if this $30,000 was in fact sufficient yeah. to open them for next year or whether we were looking at just throwing the money at something that wasn't going to happen. Mm 
If I could, Madam President, uh, would you want the amendment to read that this money shall only be available for the reopening of the park? Is this for lifeguards? I mean, uh, it's um, what's the for Connell Park and for the Novan Greeno swimming pools? Is this to pay lifeguards? What's the thirty thousand dollars to be used for? Would the amendment be to only that the thirty thousand dollars should only be used for these specific purposes? And if the pools aren't opened, the monies would then remain in the in the uh, UDAG repayment account. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, is the thirty thousand dollars is that to pay for lifeguards or is it for maintenance or to clean it? I mean, what? Does anybody know what the thirty thousand dollars is to be used for? I believe for? it was. I believe it was for repairs and upgrades that had to be made because the pools couldn't be opened as they are. So it could only be used for repairs and upgrade. Because uh, I know that seasonal employees, specifically lifeguards, their salaries are contained in the annual operating budget. And I, and I just have a question. I, uh, Next year, all the pools are going to require lifts, which is going to be another expense. Now, I don't know if they ever, did they do the lifts in the pools that we approved for this year? I don't know. I know they put the bids out and, and, and everything was accepted, but I have no idea because they extended the deadline to the end of this year. I, I know in, in these pools, I don't believe they were installed. Um, these pools, no, yeah. And I think we approved them for two or three pools. Nayog, yeah. probably, Nayog, Weston, Weston Field. Field and Weston Park. Yeah. If we can check on that, Mrs. Craig, to see if they install the lifts in those pools that were approved last year by us. They're not in the uh, I'll also check to see if um, the federal government will extend that deadline once again. I know there are a lot of communities, and not only municipalities, but um, nonprofits that have pools that, for them, it's a, it's a very big expense. Thank you. Mrs. Craig? So the limitation to be for repairs and upgrade the pool <laughs> required for their for their opening and for no other purposes. I mean that's the way I'll I'll review it and I'll draft it to that extent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. But it's not for lifeguards. It has nothing to do with no. No. With that. Okay. Six D reading by title, file of council number thirty six two thousand thirteen and ordinance authorizing the acquisition by eminent domain of the parcel affected by the Rockwell Avenue Bridge Repair Project Supplemental Agreement Number 041222-C and Federal Project Number 117-X042-060. You've heard reading by title of Item 6D. What is your pleasure? I move that Item 6D pass reading by title. Second. On the question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 6E, reading by title, file of council number 37, 2013, an ordinance authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to execute and enter into a lease agreement with Northeast Inspection Consultants for the former supply room in the Licensing Inspections and Permits Department, fourth floor, City Hall, to be used for third-party inspections. You've heard reading by title of item 6E. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6E pass reading by title. Second. On the question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 6F, reading by title, file of council number 38, 2013, an ordinance. Sale of tax delinquent property, more commonly known as 2314 Pittston Avenue, tax map number 16714010046, Scranton, Pennsylvania, to George J. Langan, Jr., 2313 Pittston Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18505, for the consideration of $5,000. You've heard reading by title of item 6F. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6F pass reading by title. Second. On the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 6G, reading by title, file of council number 39, 2013, an ordinance authorizing the mayor and other appropriate officials of the city of Scranton to enter into a lease agreement with the United Neighborhood Centers of Northeastern Pennsylvania 
known as the Cabrini Center, located at 1004 Jackson Street, Scranton, Pennsylvania, for a 10-year <coughs> period with three successive 10-year renewal terms at tenant's option. You've heard reading by title of item 6G. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6G pass reading by title. Second. On the question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 6H reading by title, file of council number 40, 2013, an ordinance authorizing the mayor and other appropriate officials of the city of Scranton to enter into a lease agreement with the United Neighborhood Centers of Northeastern Pennsylvania, known as the Bellevue Center, located at 531 Emmett Street, Scranton, Pennsylvania, for a 10-year period with three successive 10-year renewal terms at tenant's option. You've heard reading by title of item 6H. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6H pass reading by title. Second. On the question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 7A, for consideration by the Committee on Rules, for adoption, resolution number 24, 2013, appointing Alan O'Neill, Rear 1440 Church Street, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18508, as a member of the Board of Zoning Appeals for the City of Scranton. Mr. O'Neill will replace Lance Stangy Jr., whose term expires on July 1, 2013. Alan O'Neill's term will commence on July 2, 2013, and expire on July 1, 2018. As Chair for the Committee on Rules, I recommend final passage of Item 7A. Second. On the question? I'd like to thank Mr. Stangi for four years of uh, unparalleled service. We're sorry to lose him. And I wish Mr. O'Neill great success in his future service. Roll call, please. Mr. McCullough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Loscombe? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans. Yes, I hereby declare item 7A legally and lawfully adopted. 7B, for consideration by the Committee on Rules for adoption, resolution number 25, 2013, appointing Sean Walsh, 2821 Cedar Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18505, as a member of the Board of Zoning Appeals for the City of Scranton. Mr. Walsh will replace Mary Ann Wardell, whose term expires on July 1, 2013. Sean Walsh's term will commence on July 2nd, 2013 and expire on July 1st, 2018. As chair for the Committee on Rules, I recommend final passage of item 7B. Second. On the question. Again, council thanks Mrs. Wardell for her excellent service and we wish great success to Mr. Walsh. Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Loscombe? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7B legally and lawfully adopted. I would like to make a motion to take file of council number 29, 2013 from the table. Second. Second. On the question, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 7C. For consideration by the Committee on Community Development for Adoption, Ordinance 29-2013, previously tabled, authorizing the Mayor and other appropriate City officials to accept, receive, and record a gift of real estate from FMP Realty, LLC, consisting of a parcel at the intersection of Capouse Avenue and Marion Street on the northeast corner of said intersection to provide for additional parking in the neighborhood. What is the recommendation of the Chair for the Committee on Community Development? As Chairperson for the Committee on Community Development, I recommend final passage of item 7C. Second. On the question? Yes, on the question. Um, I'm very happy that we had a caucus and that both Mr. Falzetta and his father were very willing to come in and further explain this project to us. Um, when it was initially sent down, the legislation to accept the parking lot and nothing more. Um, didn't seem to be a smart choice but after hearing that there is a broader plan in place and more importantly that the Falsettes will be maintaining the land that it won't be um, our the city DPW that's 
responsible for cutting grass and cutting hedges and things of that nature. Um, I, I fully support this project and also the fact that I spoke to a few neighbors from down in the area and they think we'll finally end the eyesore of what was for, I guess, decades a very controversial parking lot. Um, so for those reasons, I will be voting yes. And just my comments, uh, you know, I think it's a great project. It's definitely going to improve that corner. But based on the history with the legal issues, I don't know if we're, we're able to make it a parking lot. It went to the Supreme Court. I haven't seen the Supreme Court ruling, but, uh, you know, that, that's a pretty strong ruling that it, it's not to be a parking lot. And for us to invest $60,000 for a parking lot there, and all we have is a, a, a verbal commitment by the developer across the street, uh, he doesn't have to stand by that to, to maintain that parking lot. But I don't know. To me, it just appears to be a public parking lot developed for a private entity. And, and that's my take on it at this point. I'm not going to kid you. Anyone else on the question? Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Loscom? No. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7C legally and lawfully adopted. If there is no further business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>